Shove it, man! <laughs> Alright, it's time for some Hawk Talk. LA Knight wrestled as Eli Drake in TNA for four years between 2015 and 2019, a fairly long time, but it was mostly a waste of time. It was frustrating to watch someone who was so obviously talented get forced into some of the rubbish that he was. Now, despite it being bad, be under no illusions, without TNA, you would never have gotten the LA Knight in the WWE we have today. As a TNA fan, it was so frustrating to watch him getting wasted, he should have been someone to build the company around. But these were the days of TNA slowly sliding into the turd zone, and for most of Drake's time in TNA, there was a few stars higher on the totem pole. Drake himself has since criticised TNA for the poor decisions and essentially calling it a washed up indie company. So what's the beef? What did he get up to and why was Eli Drake in TNA bad? Well pipe down little man, I'm the Hawk and this is the story of LA Knight in TNA. For the purpose of this video, I'm calling him Eli Drake because that's who he was at the time. Eli Drake! Things start out badly from the get-go. Eli Drake debuts in TNA in April 2015 as part of Drew Galloway's new faction, The Rising, that I like to call The Failing. Why The Failing? Because they accomplished absolutely nothing. They kept saying they were here to stand up for wrestling, but they got beaten up by everyone, and it was over before it barely started. These poor guys, Drake and Micah, were just shoved here after being released by WWE Developmental, and nobody knew who they were. Whilst the faction was a fail, Drake impressed very early on with a promo that completely overshadowed the leader, Drew Galloway. He watched Drake in awe as he delivered his killer promo. BDC, I hope you're sitting down, eyes peeled, ears open, and whether you want to or not, let me talk to you. BDC, I hope you're taking notes, because although I'm my own man, don't get lost in the sauce. Because these guys, whether you mess with them, you're messing with me. The smart money is not to mess with any of it, and that's not an insult, that is just a fact of life. The Rising just feuded with MVP's beatdown clan. But then TNA got into a legal dispute of Lucha Underground over letting Hernandez wrestle for TNA. Lucha Underground said he was still signed to their company. Weeks of the footage had to be pulled. Because The Rising and the BDC were in the middle of a feud, this affected Drake who disappeared from TV for a few weeks. The Rising then lost a match which forced them to dissolve after only two months. All because Eli Drake walked out on the match claiming he had a broken foot. He was lying. During this time, Drake wasn't allowed to cut any promos, despite clearly impressing with his first in-ring promo. You would think after seeing someone kill it on the mic, you'd want to shove the mic in their face any opportunity. In fact, Eli Drake featured so little at this time that it was easy to forget he was even there in the first place. Drake turned heel on Galloway, and this feels like the real start of his TNA run. Straight away in his first promo as a heel, he's rolling out the catchphrases. At this point, it's let me talk to you and calling everyone dummies. He also ends all his promos with that's just a fact of life. I like how he's cracking jokes about how lame the rising faction was, and the true shot that Galloway was hogging all the mic time from Eli Drake. It's an excellent promo. At this point, he's had two chances to talk, and two times he succeeded. My name is Eli Drake. How could you do that to your friend, Drew? How could you cost him the title shot? <laughs> Stop crying, dummies. But you couldn't stop blabbing over and over, telling everybody to stand up, stand up. As far as I'm concerned, you can all sit down. And my name is Eli Drake, because who'd have ever known, because Drew Galloway wanted to talk for me. So Eli Drake versus Drew Galloway is his first proper feud. They traded victories. His in-ring stuff was fine, but it was always his mic stuff that really mattered. As Impact started feuding with Global Fast Wrestling and a wild slap nuts appears, Eli Drake chose not to participate in the invasion angle and choose a side, which meant he was hardly on the show again for a couple of months. Again. Don't want to be blah, blah, blah. All you do is talk, and it's been crap from the start. Stand up, stand up. Drew, okay, you're always wasting trying to my be... breath. It disgusts me. As 2015 came to an end, Drake had won five matches in 10 months. Not a good start. It was hard to get behind somebody who was rarely on the show, and when he showed up, he didn't do much of any importance. Whenever he talked, you listened, and I just couldn't understand why TNA wasn't featuring this guy more. He clearly had the promo skills, and he sounded like The Rock. A lot of people claim that TNA was trying to rip off The Rock at this time. The guy can't help that his voice sounds similar, and what, because he has a confident delivery and trash talks people. Yeah, you're a great dancer, you're a strong guy, but put that together and it still doesn't negate the fact that you are 100% moron idiot. So 2015 was bad, but it did show glimpses of the star that TNA had on their hands. Surely 2016 is going to be a better year for the Namer of Dummies. No. No, it was possibly worse. Eli Drake continues to destroy Drew Galloway on the mic, 
God, I bet Drew Galloway was having nightmares when he learned that Knight was getting a push in the WWE. And as far as Drew's concerned, the future? Uh-uh. Because anybody with two brain cells to rub together can look at Drew Galloway for the waste of space that he is. This cross-eyed half-wit walks out like he's the savior of wrestling. Well, Drew, the only god walking this earth is Eli Drake. And this god said it's time for you to stand up and take a walk. Drew Galloway does things with action. You're all talk. I've got to love these promos, but a team with big brother D-lister Jesse Godders? This was massively below Eli Drake. Teaming with this moron wasn't helping his star rise. It was only dragging him down. The team went nowhere for the second time in Eli Drake's TNA run. Drake moved on to compete in Feast or Fired, which is a matchup where four random polls contain four random prizes. Drake received one of these random prizes, which turned out to be a shot at the TNA King of the Mountain title. Now, first of all, why anyone would want a shot at that worthless belt is beyond me, but it does seem like a decent spot to have Eli Drake if you aren't ready to push him as a main eventer. You start thinking, yeah, this could work, but he does nothing with the case. What TNA did instead was far more disgusting, vile, and horrendous. Drake was attacked by TNA comedy jobber Grado, who had just been fired by TNA. And this would now be a feud. Grado returned to TNA as a masked wrestler, now calling himself Odark the Great. Kill me. Because this is somehow allowed for someone who got fired, turning their name backwards. He worked to take Eli Drake's case. Eli Drake went on to lose to Grado in three straight matches. An overweight, masked comedy moron beat Eli Drake in three straight matches. One of them was a cage match where Drake wrestled with his ass hanging out. So he's now LA don't look at his ass night. Yeah, you can see why Eli Drake is sour about his time in TNA. How was any of this going to benefit Drake? Making him look like a complete joke. After that incredible feud with Grado, he was taken off TV for the next seven weeks of programming. When he returned, he had his first world title shot, but he lost in five minutes. Now remember that case he won a few months before? Yeah, TNA suddenly remembered it too, and Eli Drake cashed it in and beat an already unconscious wrestler for it, giving Drake his first TNA title. And it sucks. Eli Drake's also given his own talk show, which would be trotted out by TNA over the years, and they called it Fact of Life. It was most just Eli Drake trash talking and slapping this giant button, which yelled out, Dummy, yeah. Dummy, yeah. Honestly, it's pretty stupid and a bit of an overkill of Drake's catchphrase. Imagine if the WWF did this with the rock and a giant button that said, know your role or just bring it every time you hit it. You would have all gotten really sick of him. This is possibly just Eli Drake going for a period of trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. This definitely doesn't work. Drake's first few years champion is with James Storm. They had two matches together. Drake was unable to beat the Cowboy in either one before losing it to that very man. Up to this point in his TNA career, he's essentially been booked as a loudmouth who can't back up anything in the ring. Only one win for Eli Drake as champion. Where he's crying and whining, Oh, I tried so hard my whole life, and I haven't had a title in five years. Oh, my mama didn't love me. <laughs> Following that incredible feud with James Storm and title loss, Drake entered a battle royal to earn a place as the challenger for the world title. Drake actually won the match, but it wasn't exactly a big deal. Listen to the incredible names that he had to beat in that match. Basile Bracker. Grado. Meatball Shearer, Robbie E, Typhoid. Ugh, it's like a battle royal filled with the TNA biggest failures in history. But at least Drake is now the number one contender. It must be his time. He cashed in his title shot, but he loses the match to Eddie Slapnut Edwards, one of the blandest wrestlers in history, and also one that TNA are literally obsessed with to this day. Eli Drake would have made a far better choice as champion. I'm going to say tonight it feels like you've been laying across a pair of tracks and you're watching as the approach comes and you get run over by a train. Now 2016 may have started off badly for Eli Drake, but the ending is somehow worse. His next feud was of EC3, which sounds like a decent upper mid-card feud you could have. Both guys are good on the mic, they're both young, they're both full of energy. But unfortunately, there was a stipulation set for their match that if EC3 loses, he doesn't get a title shot. But if Eli Drake loses, he loses his voice. What? He will literally not be allowed to say anything for the rest of the year. Drake, of course, loses the match to EC3 because he always loses his big matches. And now he's not allowed to talk for over two months. Way to shoot yourself in the foot, TNA. Let's take one of our best assets and ruin it. The complete morons in charge of this decision deserve to be beaten in the streets with bricks to the brain. 
Because Eli Drake was unable to talk anymore, he communicated through two methods. Hitting his dummy button and his other dummy, Tyrus. Yes, Tyrus became the mouthpiece for Eli Drake. You could just see Drake sitting there desperate to trash talk some nerds. Perhaps TNA thought this would be funny, but it wasn't. And it just went on for way too long. After two months, Drake finally talked again and it was such a relief. None of these cross-eyed mouth breathers deserve to hear this voice, but if you need truth, then let me give you some truth. He speaks. The team with Typhoid went nowhere and they lost literally all of their matches. Drake was also scared of Fatboy Tyrus and literally had to pay him not to beat him up. What a great job TNA are doing making Eli Drake into a star. Can you imagine if they had Stone Cold carrying in the corner from Rikishi? You'd really want to cheer him then. Drake continued losing every one-on-one -on -one match that mattered as TNA pushed more and more new wrestlers, but never him. So things were looking bad, but they somehow got worse because Chris Masters is here. He's apparently Eli Drake's friend or something, I don't know. TNA was basically dead at this point. They were out of stars other than Lashley and John Morrison as far as stars go. Global Fast Wrestling had disappeared, but their belt remained as the number one title in TNA after El Patron left TNA. So when Eli Drake entered a gauntlet match for the vacant world title, I didn't pay any attention. He'd been booked like a joke. I wasn't there to expect anything. He was forced to enter at number two by Jim Cornette. Drake ends up going the whole distance, last beating Eddie Slapnut Edwards. Eli Drake wins his first and only world title to date. And unfortunately for him, it's the Global Force Global title. Then some stupid MMA brawl happens at ringside, so Eli Drake's title win gets zero attention. He's a complete afterthought. Just like his whole TNA run, he's not treated like he's important. He cuts a promo afterwards saying he isn't happy, he's pissed off at all the years it took and all the politics he had to deal with to get to this point. Then instead he goes off on a tangent about a cougar he met at the pool. It's honestly hilarious and has Steiner vibes to it. She's got me in her sights and she makes her way over and how appropriate because she's wearing this leopard print bikini. She's a cougar and she's looking for a cubby, yeah. She wanted to give me some of that mother's milk I only drink from the jug. She said, I got two big jugs right here. I said, I didn't mean that. I meant the plastic one. She said, these are plastic. I said, hey now. My thirst was quenched and I didn't get much rest today. He ends up holding onto the belt for 146 days and defends it five times, which I guess is okay. That's around once a month. The matches were heavy work rate matches showing the changing of the times. 20 minute matches were common for Drake. I'm not too sure if Drake has the range of moves or a specific style that can hold attention for 20 minutes. And it doesn't help that every single defense ended in a screwy way. Having every match end in a screwy way doesn't help build Drake's credibility as a champion. The Global Force Global title was thankfully renamed with a flashy new sticker to cover up the Global Fast wrestling crap. But it was too late and Drake lost the title to a re-debuting Austin Aries in a 50 second match. It was an interesting experiment having Drake hold the main belt in the company, but they were just too distracted to focus on Eli Drake and they barely focused on him. He barely appeared on the show, minus his title defences. What's 2018 got in store for old Eli? Drake apparently has a tag title shot, but he doesn't have a partner. I guess Chris Masters is gone now. That must have been so worthwhile paying for that guy. So Drake needed a partner, and suddenly things get really awesome. Scott Steiner will be his partner, he cuts a rambling promo which is hilarious. Drake says they are big bad gravy train and big bad booty daddy. Steiner seems happy to be back and he likes Eli Drake. Drake and Steiner challenge LAX for the tag belts at Redemption. It's a bit of a nothing match but Steiner does bust out a Frankensteiner in this one. Which I guess would be the final one of his career. Someone let me know in the comments if he's done one since. But yeah strangely Eli Drake won the TNA tag belts with Scott Steiner. The rematch shows that Steiner is clearly past it as he's massively out of position for the finish, but as a character he's funnier than ever. Steiner keeps trying to get over this new catchphrase, I'm world famous bitch. This team with Steiner seems to have given Drake an injection of energy. I actually like these guys together, or maybe I just like Steiner. After just one title defence they drop the belts and never bother asking for a rematch. Instead Steiner and Drake turn on each other. It leads to a singles match which Eli Drake wins. But that's because nothing was riding on that match. It wasn't important, so they let him win it. When he faces Pentagon Jr. for the title around this time, he loses. When he faces Moose for the number of contendership, he loses. For some reason, he also has a weird feud with Grado and Joe Hendry because he hit on the zombie lesbian time-traveling Winter, who is Grado's girlfriend. Oh, actually, scratch that. TNA was pretending that never happened. 
So many geeks and dummies on this show, and yet Drake is further away from the main event scene than ever. At Bound for Glory 2018, he has a two-minute match with James Ellsworth. You would have thought the impact of the stacked roster from the way that they were using Eli Drake like he was nothing. After the match, the Abyss randomly appears and chokeslams Eli Drake for a table. This would be the start of Eli Drake's final TNA storyline. Eli Drake hates hardcore wrestling. Eli Drake's still being booked to be a complete dumbass, by the way, because he hires Joseph Park to sue Impact Wrestling for the unsafe working environment he has been experiencing. And of course, his lawyer, Joseph Parks, is actually Abyss, who chokeslammed him through the table. Anyone who watched TNA around this time knows that Joseph Park is Abyss. Hang on. Drake was actually signed to TNA when they were doing the Abyss-Joseph Park thing before. So for Eli Drake to believe he's a reputable lawyer, I guess Eli Drake's the dummy. Dummy? Yeah. Drake quickly turns on his lawyer. He keeps moaning about hardcore wrestling, which of course gets the attention of fellow moaner Tommy Dreamer. They end up having a match, and thank god Drake manages to beat him. But this hardcore storyline isn't over. More hardcore stuff ends with Eli Drake facing the Abyss at the Homecoming pay-per-view, in what would be the Monsters' final TNA match. It wasn't actually bad, and Eli Drake won it, so it's got that going for it. He also gets beaten up by Tommy Dreamer in comical fashion. Then he gets beaten up by Raisin too. Because he doesn't like hardcore wrestling, he doesn't like Eddie Slapner Edwards either, because he's apparently hardcore. These two proceed to have a match which Drake loses. Seriously, what is their obsession with Slapnut Edwards? I guess the joke's on TNA because one man is now in the WWE on the verge of being a champion and the other is sat in a mouldy TNA locker room picking bogeys out of the Bullet Club's buttholes. <sighs> then Eli Drake randomly turns face and he protects Eddie Edwards. They are now a tag team. So Eli Drake is Slapnut's bitch. I guess the story is that he has finally learned to embrace hardcore wrestling. Drake's final TNA match comes in April 2019 as he and old Slapnuts fail to win the TNA tag titles from the Lucha Brothers. But it's okay because Slapnuts and Eli Drake share a hug after the match. Then Drake changes his mind and blasts him with the cane. So I guess this was going to be some sort of wacky feud, but it would never happen because things are about to get a bit mad. Drake had actually been fired by email from TNA two weeks prior to his final two matches airing because TNA taped well in advance. So why was Drake fired from TNA? Several reasons, but the main one first. TNA had set up a match, but didn't clear it of Drake first. That match was going to be him losing to women's wrestler Tessa Blanchard. Drake took to social media and said that the pay-per-view match with Tessa would not be happening. He had to be switched in the end to everyone's favourite Joey Ryan, who never had a problem wrestling women. TNA found his remarks disparaging that Eli Drake didn't think Tessa could beat a man for real. Drake also said that Killer Cross would kill Jordan Grace in a real fight. Other reasons for firing Drake included complaining on an internet podcast that TNA had booked him into oblivion. He also had heat with the Scott Demore regime. That regime tried to lock Drake into a one-year non-compete clause, but that didn't happen in the end. It was a really messy end to his four-year stay with TNA. Drake spent a year wrestling for the NWA. Whilst he was there, he captured the tag belts with James Storm. I honestly thought this was the end of Drake's career at this point. The NWA seemed to be a place where lots of old TNA talents and their careers went to die. I didn't hear much of what Drake was up to until I learned that he'd signed with NXT in 2021, now going as LA Knight. And ever since that day, the Knight has been on the rise. Yeah! Yeah! He since described his TNA world title run as worthless because it's a nothing show. Given the way things ended with TNA, you can understand how some things may have been said in anger. But honestly, looking back, Drake had every right to be angry. He was destroying people on the microphone. He adapted his ring style to having 20-minute matches. He was pushing his catchphrases. He was doing flips and trying to fit in with the other dorks. He was recognisable and marketable, but TNA didn't. Instead, they gave him a horrible win-loss record, winning only 30% of his matches in the first two years. Constant bad comedy angles, mostly losing with big matches... He was the champion, but he was never pushed as the main guy, mostly directionless and wasted. I came away thinking, well, what else could this guy have done? By the time Drake left TNA, it was a glorified indie company. Even if some good matches were still taking place, the show was dead. Maybe throwing everything behind Eli Drake would have added some star power to a show that badly needed it. You blew it. Dummy. Yeah. You choked. Dummy. Yeah. I think you lost it. I'm really happy that everyone else is finally getting to experience Eli Drake or LA Knight as he is now. 
Everyone said he's something out of the Attitude Era. So I guess you could say the wrestler you all needed was hiding in plain night. My only slight concern is that the guy is 40 years old. I know wrestlers do last a bit longer nowadays, but you have to worry if WWE will have an issue throwing everything behind a middle-aged guy. He isn't going to have a 5-star match in WWE, but who cares? There's 50 guys on the roster who can do that, but there's also 50 guys on the roster who can't entertain or cut a promo like Eli Drake. And wrestling works best with variety. So let's all enjoy him whilst he's here and hope he gets to win the world title and actually be an important part of the show. It's LA Knight's time and that's just a fact of life. And if you don't agree with that, I'll show you my knife.